Thus far in the series, we've covered medieval medicine and Renaissance medicine. So what's next? We're entering into the age of the Industrial Revolution, the Georgian and Victoria eras, and the expansion of the British Empire. What concise and intelligent sounding name does this time period have, I wonder? Fine, whatever, let's get on with this. The Renaissance had produced many new medical ideas. However, it was not until the 18th and 19th centuries that those ideas began to find practical applications. In 1700, bleeding and purging were still common treatments, even if the theory of the four humours wasn't. Apothecaries still sold herbal remedies and most medical treatments were carried out at home. By 1900, surgeons could confidently conduct safer, more complex operations. Effective vaccines were available, with more in development. Hygienic built-for-purpose hospitals were an ordinary sight and we, you know, knew what actually caused disease. That last breakthrough only happened towards the end of this period, but it's probably the single most important event in the history of medicine. So we're going to start with that. Germ theory. If you leave a piece of meat out in the open air, it soon enough becomes infested with maggots. Yum. Where did these maggots come from? In the early 18th century, no one knew for sure. Scientists of the time developed the theory of spontaneous generation as an answer, that wriggly little maggots, and on a microscopic level, wriggly little microbes, were created when the meat began to decay. Which of course is the opposite of what actually happens, it is in fact the wriggly microbes and maggots that cause the decay. The microbes get to the meat on the breeze and the maggots hatch from eggs laid by flies. French chemist Louis Pasteur was the first to be able to prove this when he demonstrated that milk went off because of bacteria. By heating milk for a short while, any microbes in the liquid would be killed and the shelf life of the milk and the human was extended. That process bears his name, pasteurization. Similar observations investigating what made wine and vinegar go bad led Pasteur to argue that bacteria could make humans go bad. I mean, catch a disease. This is germ theory, that disease is caused by microorganisms in our bodies that feed off us and reproduce, or germinate, hence the name. In a famous experiment, Pasteur heated a broth in a glass flask, which killed off any bacteria already present. Because the glass flask was designed with an S or swan-shaped neck, germ particles in the air were unable to enter. Consequently, no bacteria was found present in the broth, even after many days. This demonstrated that microbes do not spontaneously generate, they reproduce. He published his theory in 1861, and would you believe it, very few took any notice, and most who did, did dismissed it. Pasteur wasn't a doctor, his work focused on decay and spoiled food, not disease. Moreover, his theory wasn't without errors. According to him, microbes were responsible for disease. But by this time, scientists had observed many different microbes found present in the human gut, even in healthy people. It seemed impossible that these microbes could cause disease when they were so common. The fact of the matter is that there are many different types of microbes out there. They are more varied than all the plant and animals on the planet combined. Even under a microscope, they look like a confused mass of different wriggly shapes and sizes. Some of them are crucial to human health. Most seem to be neither beneficial nor detrimental. And some, of course, are deadly. So while some scientists in Britain agreed with Pasteur, germ theory was not widely accepted. What was needed was a practical application. Enter Robert Koch. In 1876, he and his research team identified the bacterium that caused anthrax. This was the first time anyone had identified the specific microbe that caused the specific disease. Koch proved that bacteria was the cause by injecting it into healthy mice, who then became sick. Through his work, he also managed to find ways to stain bacteria with chemical dyes so they could be more easily identified under a microscope, and developed a new method of growing them using agar jelly in the now common petri dish. Soon after, other disease-causing bacteria were identified in rapid succession by the followers of Pasteur and Koch, collectively known today as the microbe hunters. Whereas before, doctors had studied and treated symptoms of disease, now they could study the disease itself. Take diphtheria as an example. It was a grisly disease that mainly affected children. It caused a painful cough and fever, as well as a leathery skin that would develop over the tonsils and back of the throat, making breathing painful and difficult. By studying the microbe, scientists were able to observe that the leathery skin was in fact a poison that the bacteria produced, which would then stick to the throat. 
Studying microbes directly allowed scientists to develop a range of treatments to successfully combat diseases, the most effective of which was vaccination. Here Pasteur pops up again as he succeeded in creating a vaccine combating cholera in chickens, and later a vaccine for rabies in humans. These were the first vaccines ever created in a lab. In short order, the microbe hunters had produced other vaccines for typhoid, tuberculosis, diphtheria and tetanus. And if you haven't heard of some of those killers, you have their vaccines to thank. Now Pasteur didn't create the first ever vaccine, he created the first vaccine in a laboratory, where a weakened strain of the cholera bacteria was intentionally sought after. Using a weakened strain of bacteria has the benefit of triggering an immune response without the downside of dying. But as people weren't aware of bacteria and their different strains before Pasteur's germ theory, there was no way anyone would know to search for them. Yet despite this, a vaccine was created almost a century before Pasteur designed his. It turns out that one of humanity's biggest killers in the microbial kingdom had a weakened strain of itself already found in nature. Just like how lions and domestic cats are distantly related, so too were the bacteria smallpox and cowpox. Smallpox was a horrific disease that had been plaguing humankind for millennia. Cowpox was a much milder condition that rarely affected humans, only those who came into regular contact with livestock, like dairy maids. Edward Jenner, a country doctor who regularly treated dairy maids, noticed that when there was a smallpox epidemic, many of his dairy maid patients did not catch it. He investigated further and by 1796 had created a working vaccine. He published a book sharing his findings a year later. In the decades that followed, the smallpox vaccine was administered to millions of people all around the world and in 1980, the disease was officially declared eradicated by the World Health Organization, the first disease ever to become so. Still, back in the late 18th century, there were no fanfares heralding a new age of medical innovation. Jenner's vaccine was a one-off, made because of the chance connection between two bacteria. He did not know exactly how the vaccine worked, and he could not replicate his methods to prevent other diseases. Whilst Jenner received praise for his discovery from foreign leaders like American President Jefferson and French Emperor Napoleon, in Britain he faced fierce opposition. The church preached it was against God's will. Unscrupulous men called inoculators, who used a less effective and more dangerous smallpox treatment and did not want to see their source of income destroyed, spoke against the vaccine and encouraged the media to print negative things about it. Others simply did not believe Jenner because he was not a famous London doctor, and the Royal Society refused to publish Jenner's findings. Pfft. Sometimes change takes a long time. And other times it doesn't. Whilst acceptance of the smallpox vaccine took decades, Jenner's mentor, Dr. John Hunter, who advocated a more scientific approach to surgery, saw his ideas spread very quickly. The days of the barber surgeon were coming to an end. Surgery in this time period faced three big problems, which were pain, infection, and bleeding. And starting in the 19th century, significant developments began that solved two of those three problems. Let's start with pain. Because cutting into your body is extremely painful, surgeries by necessity tended to be very quick and so could not be very sophisticated. The most common surgery were amputations, some of which could be performed in under a minute. If surgery was ever to be able to probe deeper, the patient would need to be rendered unconscious. Anesthetics in herbal forms had been used for centuries, but their dosages were hard to control. There was a real chance if you took some, you might never wake up again. There had been attempts to find chemical anaesthetics. Both nitrous oxide and ether had both been used with some success. But it was James Simpson's discovery of the lethargic qualities of chloroform that was the real game changer. Now surgeons could operate without the patient writhing around and messing up the delicate incisions. Though a breakthrough, chloroform wasn't without its negative side effects. The dose had to be carefully controlled as it was easy to overdose a patient and kill them. This problem was overcome by another doctor, John Snow, who devised an inhaler that reduced the danger of overdosing. The anaesthetic became popular after Snow administered it to Queen Victoria during the birth of her son in 1853. But just like with Pasta, and just like with Jenna, there were some who opposed Simpson's discovery, claiming pain-free operations were unnatural, or that women deserved the pain of childbirth, as Eve, from the Bible, is the reason for all sin on earth. Ugh. Problem 1. Pain. Solved. Thanks, James Simpson. On to problem 2. Infection. 
Regardless of if a patient can't feel the surgery, if bacteria was allowed to get into a wound, it could lead to severe complications, like death, which is pretty severe. <sighs> Infection was always a risk with surgery at this time. There was no hand washing or sterilization of instruments. In fact, surgeons often wore their stained doctor's coats when operating. It was a way to display their experience. The more stained it was, the more experienced the surgeons surely must be. Consequently, many patients would survive the operations, but then die shortly afterwards from infections such as gangrene or sepsis. Deaths in surgery between the 1850s and early 1870s actually increased. Today it's known as surgery's black period. One of Pasteur's early supporters in Britain was a doctor called Joseph Lister. He reasoned that if microbes in the air were causing decay, as Pasteur argued they did, then what was needed was a chemical that would clear bacteria from wounds and act as a barrier for any more entering. In 1865, he operated on a patient with a broken leg and added a bandage soaked in carbonic acid. The wound healed cleanly. In 1867, Lister published his findings urging his medical colleagues to wash their hands before operations and use Lister's invention, a carbonic spray, to kill all germs in the air around the operating table. Infection rates in surgery dropped from 50% to 15 in four years, and by 1900, Lister's recommendations had all become standard practice. It's called aseptic surgery. But if you're worried that Lister got off easy compared to the criticism Jenner, Pasta, and Simpson faced, don't you worry. There were still many people who opposed his ideas. Some surgeons refused to use carbolic spray, claiming it dried out their hands. And as Lister was a shy man who did not enjoy public speaking, he struggled to silence his loudmouth critics. Nevertheless, over time, the data spoke for itself. With the problems of pain and infection solved, surgeons could now begin more ambitious operations. The first successful operation to remove an infective appendix was in the 1880s. The first heart operation occurred in 1896, when surgeons repaired a heart damaged by a stab wound. The one major problem still facing surgeons was the potential for heavy blood loss but that would have to be a 20th century problem to overcome. And anyway, two out of three ain't bad. The aseptic methods employed in operating theatres by 1900 were not simply due to Lister and his spray. The standard of hygiene in hospitals improved dramatically thanks to the tireless work of the most famous woman in 19th century medicine, the lady with the lamp herself, Florence Nightingale. Although much heralded as a nurse, her most significant quality was that she was a great organiser. During the Crimean War, she led a team of nurses who improved the living conditions of the wounded British soldiers, where mortality rates dropped significantly. Her work in Crimea made Nightingale a national hero back in Britain. This fame helped her raise the money she needed to set up the first ever school for nurses in 1860. She wrote two influential books that provided the basis for hospital design and the training of nurses, the latter of which helped make nursing an acceptable profession for middle-class women to pursue, one of only a very few available at the time. Nightingale was also one of the first people to use statistical diagrams to demonstrate her findings, as seen in this example, sometimes called the Nightingale Rose Diagram. Another trailblazer in using graphical representations of statistics to argue their case was the Dr. John Snow, the same one who'd administered chloroform to Queen Victoria. He mapped out the fatalities of a new plague that was befalling London in the 19th century. Not the Black Death, this was the Blue Death. A terrible disease that could kill within days or even hours. It leads to dehydration and diarrhea, and in the process ruptures blood vessels turning the victim's skin a pale blue. We call it cholera. It was a new and frightening plague not seen before the 19th century. Many blamed bad air, miasma, as the culprit, but Snow argued that cholera could not be transmitted through the air because the disease affected the guts, not the lungs. Instead, he reasoned that drinking water was being contaminated by the cholera-ridden feces being disposed of in the city's drains. Through his data journalism, Snow was able to plainly visualize how nearly all the cholera cases were clustered around one water pump on Broad Street in Soho, London. By the simple expedient of having the pump handle removed, he ended that outbreak. Can you guess by now what the response to this brilliant example of science in action was? That's right. The government immediately accepted proof that cholera was transmitted by water and promptly began a massive public works project. Only kidding, he was ignored. Outside the community who drank from the Broad Street pump, Snow's impact was limited. Starting to see a pattern? <sighs> Innovative ideas that challenged the accepted doctrine of the time 
will often be ignored or even face fierce backlash. To this day, the annual Pump Handle Lecture, held in London, attempts to shine a light on the continuing challenges scientists face in advancing public health. They do this by ceremonially removing and replacing a pump handle. Or as the German polymath Alexander von Humboldt famously put it, there are three stages in scientific discovery. First, people deny that it is true. Then, they deny that it is important. Finally, they credit the wrong person. Now, I haven't been trying to deceive you by crediting the wrong people, but for every name I've mentioned, there were many others whose vital contributions get overlooked, especially if you're female. Medical progress in this period was the result of many interconnected factors, not just individuals, it was also institutions, the actions of government, seismic shifts in society, science, technology, communications, and politics that accompanied the Industrial Revolution. So let's take a very quick look-see. One impossible to overlook factor was the population explosion Britain experienced in this period. In 1700, there were 8.2 million people. By 1900, there were five times as many. Nearly all the population growth was in towns because this was where the factories were and the workers had to live close to them as there were no railways or other transport links until much later. Factory owners and other entrepreneurs happy to put profits before people built cheap housing and crammed them full of workers with little or no thought to their well-being or sanitation. Water supplies still came from wells or rivers, the latter of which were still where sewers emptied into. Most people had to share outside toilets where the waste needed to be dug out and disposed of on carts. All this meant that many people found themselves living and working in worse conditions than their ancestors had in the Middle Ages. What was needed was government regulation, but regulation would cut into the profits of the factory owners, whose patronage politicians relied on, and would only benefit the poorer elements of society who had no political power whatsoever. Where was the motivation to act? When Edwin Chadwick, a lawyer and social reformer, published a report calling for improved sanitation for all, the government largely ignored him, just like they were to do with Snow's appeal a few years later, or Joseph Bazalgette's plan for a sewer system for London in 1858. Eventually, after more people gained the right to vote, after Pasteur's germ theory became more widely accepted, and after a summer heatwave that made the polluted River Thames so stinky politicians couldn't stand working near it, the government began to take more action. The 1875 Public Health Act made it compulsory for local councils to improve sewers and drainage. Public parks were created for exercise and enjoyment. Inspectors were employed to check everything from the cleanliness in housing to the quality of food in shops. This, for example, stopped unscrupulous bakers from mixing chalk into the flour to make their bread appear whiter. There was also advances in science, technology and communication brought about by the Industrial Revolution that the world had never seen before. When Bazalgette built London's sewer system, for instance, he used engineering knowledge that had not been available even a hundred years earlier. Inventions like the flushing toilet, steel syringe needles, and improvements in glassmaking for microscope lenses and thermometers all contributed to a rise in living standards and life expectancy. But the increase was modest. The average age of death in 1900 was 46 for men and 50 for women. Many still suffered major health problems because of dirt and poverty. The government gave no help to the sick, unemployed or elderly, no matter what their circumstances were. Those who couldn't afford to see medical professionals had to rely on homemade remedies that had more in common with medieval ones than treatments used today. If someone caught influenza, for example, they were advised to drink ginger mixed with tea, or they could mix half a pound of treacle with half a pint of vinegar and three tablespoons of laudanum, taken three times a day, to no effect. If home remedies didn't work, people could also buy patent medicines, often known as cure-alls. These were big business, largely thanks to massive advertising campaigns that were full of false assertions. There were no regulations over manufacturing standards or the ingredients used until the 1880s, meaning businesses could say whatever they wanted without fear of prosecution, regardless of the fact that their claims were not true. Common ingredients actually included things like lard, wax, turpentine, soap and ginger. But that didn't stop businesses from selling millions of boxes of pills every year. Advances in medicine had been gathering momentum throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, but most people were still not benefiting from it. This was to change in the 20th century, when our technology and living standards began to improve to levels previously thought impossible. 
bringing with them new challenges, but also giving us the luxury to take for granted the medicines we have access to, dismiss injuries that in the past could have proven fatal, and forget about plagues that had brought such misery to our ancestors. At least for now.